we're going to start off with water quality. And you, 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 when we say water quality, you know, you think about good water and bad water. Um, I'm going to try and describe the properties that may make water either good or bad. And there are going to be a, a variety of different sources that you can use to get the water for your recirculating nutrient solution. Um, the three most common solution, or the, the three most common sources of water for any hydroponic nutrient solution is going to be uh, something like a well, a municipal water source, or using reverse osmosis. You may notice um, one water source is conspicuously missing from this list, and that would be a surface water. And this would be something like a pond, perhaps. Um, while we may use surface water very commonly for ornamental plant production, in food crop production, we have to start thinking about food safety. And surface water uh, can potentially accumulate undesirable pathogens with respect to food safety. Um, so we're, again, we want to try and have a safe water source. But in addition to a safe water source, we want to try and start off with the highest quality water that you can afford. Um, the reason being is that when we're recirculating these nutrient solutions, we have the opportunity to save on water. You know, one of the statistics that you'll hear is that um, lettuce produced hydroponically in a greenhouse uses 95% water, 95% less water than lettuce produced in a field. And again, that's because of the recirculating nature of these systems. But we're also trying to have high quality water because the longer we can recirculate our nutrient solutions, we can also save money on fertilizers by keeping them in solution and available for plants to take up. Um, when we're looking at different sources of water, you want to try and avoid undesirable or elevated levels of certain um, ions. Specifically, sodium, chlorine, and iron can be problematic. Um, sodium can be problematic because it's going to erase the electrical conductivity of your water, but it's not really going to be providing an essential element for that plant to grow. Chlorine we want to keep an eye on because that can uh, inhibit the growth of our plants and it can be uh, toxic to some plants depending on the concentration that it is in your water. And then finally, you also see iron on this list. Iron is one of the 12 essential elements that we want to provide to our plants. Um, and there are some plants that we'll talk about later, like arugula, that have a high iron requirement. So some iron is not bad. However, elevated levels of iron in your water can cause problems with your equipment. In particular, you, if you get too much iron building up in your water sources, you can start to get the buildup of uh, blue-green algae. Blue-green algae can end up clogging emitters. Um, in your hydroponic system, specifically in the nutrient film technique system, where you've got microtubing or small diameter um, plumbing in your system. So we want to try and avoid these things like sodium, chlorine, iron. That's why we always want to perform uh, a water quality test before you start growing, just to see what the back quality of your water is going to be. Okay, so in addition to here, in addition to water quality, we also want to look at the pH of our nutrient solution. Okay. So what is pH? Uh, I, I do want to stop and take a, a few minutes to just talk about what pH is, because we hear about what it is, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page as far as understanding what it is. So here I've got just a diagram showing two different water sources, a low pH water source and a high pH water source. pH is the uh, concentration of hydrogen ions in your water, but it's a negative decimal logarithm, okay? So when we look at a water with a low pH, that means that we have a high concentration of hydrogen ions or protons in our water. So that's sort of the counterintuitive part, is that the higher the concentration of protons, the lower the pH value. Alternatively, a high pH means we have a low concentration of hydrogen ions, but we've got a high concentration of hydroxyl ions, okay? So there's just the difference between low pH and a high pH. Now, the reason we want to understand this is because um, we can learn how growing crops will affect the pH of our nutrient solution. You know, we know that the pH can affect nutrient availability, in particular, a low pH makes micronutrients more available, and a high pH makes micronutrients less available. 
and we want to keep our nutrients in solution and available for uptake. But it's not just the water quality that's going to affect our pH of our nutrient solution. It can also be plant growth. So here we've got an example of acidic nutrient uptake. And you can see my uh, diagram of a plant grown hydroponically. Okay, And when we talk about acidic nutrient uptake, we're talking about the uptake of ammoniacal nitrogen or ammonium. It's a positively charged ion. Okay, So when, when, that, when that's taken up by root, Plants need to maintain an electrochemical balance within their root to properly function. So when a positively charged um, ion is taken up, like ammonium, the plant will exude another positively charged ion. In this case, it's going to be a proton or that hydrogen ion. Okay. So what happens is when plants take up ammonium, they're going to release that hydrogen proton. As the plants take up that ammonium and release more hydrogen protons, those are going to accumulate, and again, the greater concentration of hydrogen ions, the lower the pH is going to be, and our pH is going to drop. So that's how why we call it acidic nutrient uptake, and that's why we consider nitrogen an acidic form of nitrogen. But the converse is also true when we take up nutrients that are negatively charged. Okay, so here we've got a um, negatively charged ion in nitrate. And nitrate is a pretty important nutrient in hydroponic crop production because it makes up the majority of the form of nitrogen that we have in our fertilizers. It's not uncommon for a hydroponic fertilizer to be 93, 95 plus percent nitrate nitrogen. So when that nitrate, negatively charged ion, is taken up, again, the plant wants to maintain that electrochemical balance within its root. So what it's going to do, it takes up positively charged ion, and it's going to exude a positively charged ion. Again, in this case, it's going to be that hydroxyl ion. Now, going back to that definition of pH, you know that the greater concentration of hydroxyl ions that we've got, we're going to have a higher pH, okay? And this is going to raise the pH of our nutrient solution. So this is something to consider, especially given that nitrate is so common in hydroponic fertilizers. It's not just the type of fertilizer that can affect the pH of your nutrient solution. Uh, we can see the pH change just based on the effect of plants growing. In particular, the respiration of roots. Okay, so when roots respire, they take up oxygen, and then they give off carbon dioxide and water. When that root gives off carbon dioxide from respiring, the carbon dioxide is going to react with water to form carbonic acid. And that is ultimately going to be increasing the number of hydrogen ions in solution. And that carbonic acid is going to end up driving down the pH of your crop. So let's say you've got an NFT system that's all planted with lettuce. One thing that you'll notice is that towards the end of production, you'll start to see potentially a greater drop in the pH of your nutrient solution. Well, one of the things that could be at play here is that as those plants get older, the root systems are getting larger, larger root systems respire more, and those greater amounts of root respiration in the nutrient solution is going to give off more carbonic acid, thus driving down that pH, again, just from greater root growth and more root respiration. So just like in soil-based crop production, there are a range of recommended nutrient solution uh, pHs for leafy crops. And here I've just put up some examples from lettuce, spinach, and including basil, parsley, and rosemary. So you can see that you've got a range in production. Now, if you're growing culinary herbs, you almost always have a polyculture where you've got multiple species growing. And even if you're growing lettuce, it's fairly common to have just lettuce growing. So when you have multiple species growing, what pH are you going to have for your nutrient solution? They're all going to be likely provided with that same nutrient solution, so you have to try and figure out what's going to be the best pH. You can see looking at this range of crops that somewhere between 5.6 and 6.0 is going to be a good pH range for a variety of leafy crops. Again, I've just got um, some examples up here. Now you'll notice that um, rosemary requires a higher pH, but again, when you're growing in these polyculture systems with multiple species, it's a lot harder to accommodate those outliers, and you have to try and provide the best pH that's going to be most well-suited for the majority or the largest percentage of the crops that you're growing. 
So again, looking at most of the crop requirements, you can see why there's a recommendation to maintain a pH between 5.6 and 5.8. So uh, again, by keeping in the pH in the correct range, it's going to make sure that we have adequate nutrient availability. And this is especially important for micronutrients because again, at a higher pH, micronutrients will fall out of range. If you need, if you're using water with a high pH, you may need to lower your pH initially. Alternatively, if you see your pH start to drift upwards throughout production, you'll need to lower your pH during production. The only way to lower your pH is going to acidify your water. And there's a number of different acids you can use, including sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid, citric acid, and nitric acid. Sulfuric acid is probably going to be one of the most common, if not the most common um, acid that's available. Alternatively, if you're working perhaps in an educational setting with uh, students or maybe in a, a classroom or some other um, setting where you've got maybe non-specialists uh, non working with you, you might choose something like citric acid. It's a much weaker acid and won't be as effective, but it's generally going to be much safer. So the acid that you select is going to be t depending on a couple of different factors. Alternatively, if you are using very pure water, or you have that crop that's maturing, you got greater root respiration driving down your pH, you may need to increase the pH of your nutrient solution. So you'll need to add an alkali or a base to your solution. Um, the two most common are going to be potassium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide. I think you tend to see potassium hydroxide used more than sodium hydroxide because when you add potassium hydroxide and it dissociates, the hydroxide is going to neutralize some of those protons, and that's going to leave some potassium in solution. Well, that's going to be a nutrient that can be taken up by plants. Alternatively, sodium, again, it's not an essential element, and so we don't want to be adding a bunch of sodium to our systems. That's why I tend to see pot potassium hydroxide used more frequently. Um, like I just mentioned uh, with that potassium hydroxide example, anytime you're adding acids or bases to your nutrient solution, they're going to be adding nutrients to your nutrient solution in addition to adjusting your pH. Okay, so if you're adding phosphoric acid, you're not only going to be neutralizing some of that alkalinity in your water and lowering the pH, you're also going to be adding um, phosphorus to your nutrient solution. Alternatively, with that potassium hydroxide example, as you add that, you're not only going to be neutralizing some of the hydrogen ions, but you're also going to be adding potassium to your nutrient solution. So when we're trying to avoid nutrient imbalances, that's one of the things that we want to keep in mind is when we're adding an acid or base, what sort of nutrients are we also adding as part of that acid or base addition? So regular nutrient testing will help keep these specific nutrient concentrations in check. Just an example, here we have uh, what happens when you're adding a base to a nutrient solution. Here's the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium concentration of a nutrient solution used to grow basil. And the initial nutrient concentrations when we planted the crop was about 250 parts per million nitrogen, just under 100 parts per million phosphorus, and 190 parts per million potassium. After three weeks of adjusting the pH, and we had to use potassium hydroxide to raise it, you can see that we actually got an increase in the potassium concentration. Now that's in addition to the uptake from the plants, in addition to fertilizer that was being added. So you can see that using that potassium hydroxide increased the potassium concentration in our nutrient solution. So this is one of the benefits of periodically submitting samples of your nutrient solution to be analyzed by a commercial laboratory. Okay, so we've talked we've got your uh, we've got your high quality water source and we've talked about the pH, but what concentrations of nutrients should be in your nutrient solution? Um, here we have an example of the range of nutrients for a lettuce solution. Okay, Now this is just a composite range from a number of different samples. So this represents a generic lettuce or leafy green uh, recommended concentration of nutrients. Now there are three nutrients that I would like to highlight in this formulation. Nitrogen, calcium, and iron are particularly important. So with leafy crops, nitrogen is going to be promoting the vegetative growth of our plants. If we were growing a fruiting vine crop, such as um, cucumbers or tomatoes or peppers, 
we may not be adding as, or maintaining as high a concentration of nitrogen because we're not necessarily trying to promote as much vegetative growth as we are between vegetative growth and fruit growth. But when we're growing lettuce, specialty greens, and culinary herbs, we're growing them for their foliage. And so we want to promote that vegetative growth. So nitrogen is going to be one of the most important nutrient concentrations you want to monitor. Next to nitrogen, we also want to keep in mind our calcium concentrations. Calcium concentrations are extremely important, especially for lettuce. Now, if we're, again, if we're growing a fruiting crop, we're trying to add calcium because those developing cucumbers, developing peppers, and especially developing tomatoes have a high calcium requirement. If they don't have enough calcium, you'll get blossom end rot. When we're growing lettuce and leafy greens, calcium deficiency also leads to um, a uh, tip burn on your crop. That's going to be the most common physiological disorder uh, on lettuce with respect to nutrient solution and nutrient imbalances. Uh, Neil Matson is going to talk about that a little bit more on Friday, um, but I just wanted to highlight the role of calcium in any leafy green fertilizer program. We want to have sufficient calcium to avoid tip burn. And then finally, we also want to maintain sufficient iron. Earlier, I mentioned arugula. Arugula is a high iron requiring crop. Um, without sufficient iron, you're going to get intervenal chlorosis that may render your crop not only less productive, not giving you as much mass, but it also may not be as um, visually appealing and as marketable as possible. There are other crops such as uh, cilantro and basil, which can also have iron deficiency if insufficient iron is provided. So while all 12 essential elements are important in any nutrient program for leafy greens, um, again, I want to stress the importance of nitrogen, calcium, and iron for promoting vegetative growth and maintaining leaf greenness, respectively. But um, when we talk about nutrients for day in and day out management, we manage the nutrient concentration by measuring the electrical conductivity. The electrical conductivity measures the total amount of ions in our nutrient solution, and it reflects the overall status of nutrient concentrations. It's important to note that EC does not indicate the amount of any specific ion or any nutrient in particular. It reflects the overall concentration of nutrients. However, um, that's a good indicator of the relative amount of fertilizer or nutrients available to our plants. And just to show you an example of uh, low EC and a high EC, I'm a visual learner. A low EC has relatively few ions or fewer ions in solution. Alternatively, that high EC is going to have more ions in solution. Okay. Now, when we're measuring EC, those nutrients that are in very high proportion, like nitrogen, potassium, and calcium, they're going to be um, making up a majority of the ions compared to some of those micronutrients that may be in a much, much lower concentration. But again, we try to have balanced uptake and we try to have balanced fertilizer additions. Um, so the EC generally reflects the amount of nutrients available for plant uptake. Uh, and what we do in a recirculating system is we constantly adjust the nutrient solution electrical conductivity to maintain target levels within our system. And what sort of target EC are we shooting for with lettuce and herb production? Well, a classic answer is that's going to depend. It depends on several factors, such as the crop stage, the species, or the environmental conditions that you might be growing under. And here we have some recommended nutrient solution ranges from different species. And you can see that we have variation in the electrical conductivity requirements of lettuces and leafy greens. Again, in a multi-species situation, where are you going to maintain your EC? Well, it depends on the species that you're growing and it depends on the amount of the different species that you're growing. But broadly speaking, we're looking for somewhere between one to two parts per million is where we're to maintain our nutrient solution. Okay? That's going to generally meet the requirements for a number of different uh, leafy green and herb species. But let's take a closer look at how these requirements um, can affect species. So this is some of the work that we've been doing here at Iowa State, trying to identify what nutrients require what types of, or what uh, level of EC. Here we've got arugula and pak choy, and we've got them grown from electrical conductivities ranging from 0.5 up to 5.0 millisiemens. Now for arugula and pak choy, 
are they're relatively light feeders. Now, between 0.5 and 2.0, we really don't see an effect on the fresh mass, which is our yield in these leafy crop production systems. However, as you start to increase the electrical conductivity above 2.0, we do start to see a decrease in our fresh mass. Okay, So they're relatively light feeders, and yields are going to decrease above 2 millisiemens per centimeter. But they're relatively uh, unaffected or similar between 0.5 and 2.0. Here we've got uh, another leafy crop, kale. This is increasing with popularity and we're starting to see more of it grown. Now, kale yields are going to be lower at 0.5 millisiemens, but as we increase above 0.5 millisiemens, and they're growing from 1.0 to 5.0 millisiemens, we really don't see much variation or much increase in the yield. So as long as you get at least 1.0 for kale, you're going to be maintaining uh, healthy crop growth. And you don't really get a benefit by increasing it up to four or five. We'd really never want to maintain a hydroponic solution that high because it would just be um, more fertilizer than is necessary. But one of the reasons why you see uh, that limitation at 0.05 is that if you look very closely at that plant fertilized with 0.5, you can see that there's some yellowing leaves in the center. That's because at that low fertilizer concentration, We've, we've found that kale gets sulfur deficiencies, and this is a pretty rare nutrient deficiency. It's not very common, but kale has all those amino acids or all these health compounds that contain uh, the amino acid methionine, which has sulfur in it. So it's got a higher sulfur requirement. Now, one of the reasons why using a higher EC, you don't see that sulfur deficiency is that a lot of your micronutrients are going to come in a sulfate form. So just by using a stronger fertilizer concentration, you've got more micronutrients. More micronutrients has more of those sulfates in there, and you're going to have a higher sulfur concentration. Another thing that you could do is add Epsom salts or magnesium sulfate to try and reduce the incidence of that sulfur deficiency. Swiss chard is an interesting crop. Now, as Swiss chard um, is grown below 2.0, like at 0.5 or 1.0, we see that yields are limited. Okay, so you want to be growing with at least uh, 2.0, otherwise you're not maximizing that fresh mass production. And that's really what we're trying to grow. Alternatively, as you go above 2.0 millisiemens, we start to see a reduction in fresh, fresh mass from too much nutrients being provided and salt stress from a high EC. So that's why we do not want to fertilize too much more than 2.0. So Swiss chard, um, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like um, Goldilocks. You don't want to have it too low of an EC and not high EC. You want to have a just right EC. It's not as light a feeder as, say, the arugula or the pak choy. Now, there are going to be some crops that have uh, a little bit less of a response or even no response to EC. Sweet basil is a good example of a plant that really doesn't respond too much to electrical conductivity. When you're frequently adjusting your nutrient solution, say at least once per day, increasing the EC of your crops does not increase the yield of sweet basil. Now, this is going to be um, maybe not too surprising because sweet basil is a culinary herb, and herbs are generally fairly resource use efficient. And so that's why we can get as good a yield under that 0.5 EC as we can under a 4.0 EC. Again, as long as it's adjusted daily. Now, if you're adjusting your nutrient solution less frequently, say every other day, every third day, um, twice a week, something like that, um, you probably are going to need to maintain a higher EC in order to maintain a sufficient amount of nutrients for those plants. But this trend of um, being unaffected by EC is something that we saw in other culinary herbs, including cilantro, flat leaf parsley, and dill. For all these species, we do not see increasing yield with increasing electrical conductivity. And again, the same explanation. These herbs are relatively resource use efficient. So as long as you're adjusting your EC at least once a day or more frequently, if you've got auto adjusters, you're really flexible as to which EC you can run these crops at. Again, when you look at all these varieties, you want to try and hit that middle uh, in electrical conductivity that's going to work for the variety of species that are growing in your system. How are you going to provide these nutrients to your plants growing in hydroponic system? Well, there's really three ways to approach maintaining your nutrient concentrations in hydroponic solutions. 
using a single complete fertilizer, using a two bag complete fertilizer, we call that an A and a B, or using individual compounds. One, a single complete fertilizer is going to be one bag providing all the mineral nutrients required for your crop. This is going to be the easiest of the fertilizer options that you have, um, just because it's a single bag. This minimizes mixing errors. Now, it doesn't eliminate them because you could still measure an incorrect amount out of that single bag, but you're only measuring a single nutrient. Now, one of the drawbacks is that proportions of nutrients are going to be fixed in this fertilizer. Every time you add any of that fertilizer, all of the macro and micronutrients are going to be in that same fixed proportion. Two bag complete fertilizer is a similar concept to the single bag in that you're going to have a fertilizer that's pre-mixed. However, it's going to be in two bags. It's pretty much going to be your calcium nitrate one in one bag and then everything else in a second bag. Um, these are going to be mixed separately in an A tank and a B tank. And you're going to use these separate tanks to avoid nutrient precipitation at high concentrations. In particular, you're trying to avoid the precipitation of calcium and uh, out of your solution. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. By injecting these nutrients separately, your calcium nitrate in one injector and from one stock solution, and then your other macro and micronutrients in the other, that's going to provide these fertilizers and dilute them down and avoid precipitation. In your A tank is where you're generally going to keep your calcium and then your chelated iron. Okay, and this is an iron in a chelate form, not in a sulfate or in a combination. So in your A tank, you've got your calcium. In your B tank, you're going to keep your phosphorus and most importantly your sulfates because what we're really trying to avoid the most notorious precipitate in a hydroponic system is going to be calcium sulfate you might know that as gypsum and while some people may add that to their garden outdoors we don't want to have it in our nutrient solution when calcium sulfate forms and it precipitates that calcium comes out of solution and it's not going to be available for the plant to take up Less calcium available for uptake runs the risk of getting something like a tip burn on your lettuce crop. Final uh, method of maintaining your electrical conductivity is by making fertilizer solutions of individual pond compounds. Now this is going to be where you have again an A tank and a B tank um, and you're going to keep your calcium and your iron in one tank and your phosphorus and your sulfates in another tank but you're going to use individual fertilizers to make your, um, your entire solution. You'll use calcium nitrate in one tank, then you'll use uh, calcium, or I'm sorry, magnesium sulfate, um, molybdenum, um, uh, molybdenum oh, excuse me, molybdenum uh, hydrate in one tank. Uh, you'll be using all these individual ingredients. Now, this is what the fertilizer our companies are doing when they're making one or two bag mixes, is they're simply taking these fertilizer salts and they're mixing them for you. You can do this exact same thing by buying the individual uh, fertilizer salts, or as I call them, the ingredients. And just like um, buying your own ingredients and cooking at home uh, can be less expensive than eating out, it's the same thing, making your own fertilizers can be less expensive to make yourself. Um, one of the big benefits of these individual compounds to mix your own is that you can modify your nutrient levels. So if your crop, if there's sufficient um, concentrations of one nutrient of your crop, you can modify your fertilizer and add less of that, and that's going to allow you to modify your nutrient concentrations or that you're adding to your fertilizers versus those pre-mixed bags, which are all going to be in fixed proportions. Now, when you have more compounds that you're mixing up, this can allow for more mixing errors simply due to the fact that you're adding and measuring more compounds. You also have to think about adding about how much of a compound that you'll need. Um, for example, if we're trying to add molybdenum, we're using sodium molybdate. Are you going to need 100 pounds of that on stock? Um, or is that an investment that the fertilizer company can make? and use that to make those pre-mixed bags that you're buying. So these are some of the things that you want to think about when you're putting together your fertilizers. So take home messages, recirculating hydroponics can conserve water and fertilizers. The initial water quality is going to affect your nutrient solution maintenance as well as the crop growth. You want to be mindful of things like sodium, um, chlorine, and water. 
then you also want to be mindful of both the pH and the electrical conductivity of your nutrient solutions, um, what they're going to be formulated and maintained to, because we want to be providing the right pH and the correct electrical conductivity to allow our crops to maximize their fresh mass production or their fresh weight for harvest, as well as have them appear healthy and marketable and avoid nutrient uh, deficiency or toxicity symptoms that may render them unmarketable. Um, so again, this is really just meant to be a primer on how to put together a nutrient program. Now, this Friday, Dr. Matson, Neil Matson from Cornell, is going to be talking about adjusting nutrients in a closed irrigation system. Neil's going to be talking a little bit more about how to avoid nutrient imbalances and how to maintain your nutrient solutions and how to diagnose some of those problems that may result uh, from nutritional disorders um, resulting from improper um, nutrient solution management or potentially environmental effects from um, the environment your crop is growing in. So uh, in addition to the great webinars that we've got coming up um, this Friday, you're going to get a little bit more information on hydroponic nutrient solutions. I would like to take the opportunity to promote um, the electronic grower resources online or eGrow. This is something that uh, Rosa Rodales on UConn is a part of, and it's really uh, an aggregation of a number of different universities working together to try and get you production information. And in addition to information on producing ornamental plants, we also have information on producing uh, food crops as well from greenhouses and other controlled environments. So in the spring, we have weekly alerts that are sent out that are going to highlight some of the uh, timely problems that we've got, but we've also got um, other special webinars and research reports and all sorts of information that's meant to help you out as growers. And the best part about it is the price. It is free 99. It costs nothing to you. This is something all of us uh, university specialists are getting together just to try and um, Put all of our collective heads together in order to help growers as best that we can. Um, so uh, we will, uh, I'm going to escape out of this um, and I'll start to take some questions. Um, I just want to let you know that if you have more questions after today, if I don't get around to answering your questions or as you're thinking about this stuff, you've got more, please feel free to email me at ccurry at iastate.edu or feel free to hop on the phone and just give me a call, 515-294-1917. I would also be more than happy to take uh, your phone calls too.